Okay everyone, this is the drug trolley that's in every uh, theatre in the main anaesthesia complex and there's a number of different drugs that we commonly use in anaesthetics and that's what I'm going to go through today. So I've laid out some of the things we commonly use today and I'll go through them in the order that we tend to use them. So in my first syringe here I have fentanyl. Fentanyl is a very potent short-acting opiate anaesthetic or opiate agent. We use it for two reasons. The first reason is that if we give fentanyl this strong opiate we can give less of our anaesthetic agent which is propofol here. So the two of them work together to help induce the patient into anaesthesia so it's a synergistic effect. Also fentanyl because it is a potent opiate has of course pain relieving effects. When we put someone to sleep and we do a laryngoscopy or manipulate their airway it can be very painful. So this helps anaesthetize, or not anaesthetize, at least analgese the airway we should say. So it contributes to the anaesthetic and it helps analgese the airway as we put someone to sleep. Our next drug here is propofol. So propofol is this white solution here. We tend to have it in 10 or 20 ml syringes. It's available in big 50 ml bottles like this or in 20 ml vials. And it looks like milk. It's one of the few drugs that we don't label. You'll see all my drugs are labeled, but propofol is the only one we have that looks like this. So we tend not to label it. So there are two drugs that we use to put somebody to sleep. There are other general anesthetics that we can give intravenously, but this is the most common one we use. The next drug I have here is rocuronium. So rocuronium is a muscle relaxant, or one of the muscle relaxants we have. We tend to keep it in five or 10 mil syringes, and we do this for safety. We tend to use the same types of syringes every time so that we don't accidentally grab the wrong syringe. So we label them, we only draw up one drug at a time, and we tend to use the same type of syringe every time. Just repetition is safe. So this is our rocuronium here, rocuronium bromide, 10 milligrams per mil. So there's 50 milligrams in this five mil vial that I have here. And we always check the date of expiry as well to make sure that it is safe to give. So that's our muscle relaxant. Once we have the muscle relaxant in, we give it a short period of time to work. Rocuronium takes about 90 seconds to work. And once that has worked, then we put in the laryngoscope into the airway and intubate the patient. Once our patient is asleep, we have a number of concerns. First of all, just keeping them asleep. We tend to use a vapor, an anesthetic vapor to keep somebody asleep. So that's a vapor that is injected by the anesthetic machine into the air that the patient is breathing. Here are our vapors. So the most commonly used one is sevoflurane, certainly the most commonly used here. And these are all drugs that are derivatives of ether. So they're still based around the original structure of ether, one of the first anesthetic agents. So sevoflurane is yellow. It has this particular key on the top of it that only fits into a yellow sevoflurane vaporizer. Each vapor is a different structure, a different drug, a different chemical structure. So each vaporizer is designed specifically for that particular drug. And that's why they all work together and they're all color coded. You can see another vapor back here. This is desflurane. Supreme is the trade name for it, so desflurane. And this, you can see the top of it looks different. So there's a different lock and key mechanism on this. It's blue and it only will go into the blue desflurane vaporizers. The other one you may see around our theater complex is isoflurane, which is purple and again has a different top and will only work with a purple vaporizer. So that's how we keep someone asleep most of the time. We do have the option to do what we call TIVA, total intravenous anesthesia. And that is where we give an infusion, an intravenous infusion of an anesthetic drug, typically propofol. For the vast majority of anesthetics you will see around here, you will see the vapors being used. Okay, so once a patient is asleep, my concerns are going to be looking after um, them during the procedure and for their pain relief afterwards. So let's talk about pain relief. We use the WHO pain ladder. So we start with our simple analgesic. So you see we have a bottle of paracetamol here, 1000 milligrams and 100 mils. So that's our simple analgesia. And the other component to our simple analgesia is non-steroidals. So I have two non-steroidals here. I have diclofenac or diphene, trade name, so 75 milligrams in this vial here, so for an adult. And I also have Coral is the 
trade name. This is Dex Keto Pro from Tromatamol. A little bit of a, a mouthful. So that's another intravenous um, non-steroidal. We obviously just give intravenous or largely give intravenous drugs in theatre just because that is our uh, most appropriate access method. The patient obviously can't take something orally. We do have diphene and paracetamol as suppositories here. So we sometimes give suppositories. We consent the patient for them before they go to sleep and we often give them to children or people who are having a very quick procedure so that it's the drug is already in, it's in very quickly uh, and gets to work. Whereas we may not have time to give a full intravenous dose of a drug if it's a very quick procedure. So that's the beginning of our simple analgesia, paracetamol and, and non-steroidal. I have three different types of local anesthetic here. We've lots of different types about the place, but here's a few different types. This is xylocaine. So xylocaine is lidocaine with adrenaline you see with adrenaline it has the adrenaline in red so it's a two percent lidocaine solution with one in two hundred thousand adrenaline okay so we give the adrenaline with it for a few reasons one of them is that it causes vasoconstriction in the local area so the local anesthetic lasts longer because it's not being absorbed by the body as quickly and also there's accidental intravenous or intravascular injection you will see a tachycardia very quickly from the adrenaline so that's our xylocaine this is bupivacaine which is a longer acting more potent local anesthetic it's, this is 0.25 percent so that means 2.5 milligrams per mil um, and this is also with adrenaline okay We also have just plain lidocaine here. It tends to come in one and two percent bottles. This is a two percent bottle, so two percent lidocaine. We always check expiry dates. So that's an option. We can either do a nerve block, and we'll do a little video for you guys in our block bay here, so you know how we do nerve blocks. But you can also just give the um, the local anaesthetic directly to the area that you're operating on. So sometimes we just give local anaesthetic to the surgeons and they will inject it around any incisions that they have made to help any um, analgesia the patient afterwards. Next we have opiates. So we don't tend to use weaker opiates when we've been talking about the WHO pain ladder. The next step is weak opiates, but we don't tend to use those in theatre. If somebody uh, requires opiates, we tend to go straight for strong opiates. The common strong opiates that we use in theatre are morphine, and we tend to make them up one milligram per mil. So this, it comes in a little vial and I dilute it up with some saline in a 10 mil syringe so I can give one milligram at a time if necessary. So morphine and oxycodone are two of the common drugs that we would use in theater like this. Again, the oxycodone will be made up to one milligram per mil, just like this. The reason we don't give fentanyl for longer acting analgesia is because fentanyl is very quick on and quick off. So it's potent, but it doesn't last terribly long. So that's why we tend to give our morphines. Another thing I'm concerned about when I have a patient asleep under anesthesia is antiemetics or antiemesis. Um, anesthesia can make people nauseated. Some people are at higher risk than others, but most people will give one or two antiemetics too. If somebody has a history of having post-operative nausea and vomiting, so PONV, post-operative nausea and vomiting, then we will give either different antiemetics or additional antiemetics. So the two most common ones that we would give around here are dexamethasone. So dexamethasone is of course a steroid and this comes in eight milligrams in two mils typically. And we give four to eight milligrams to people and it's not entirely known how it is so good as an antiemetic, but it is. The other drug that we use is ondansetron. So it tends to come in either four milligram or eight milligram vials. Again, checking the expiry date on it. So they're the two drugs that we commonly give for anti-emesis. I'll talk about this one in just a moment. Over here, I have my emergency drugs. So under anesthesia, things that I'm concerned about happening to the patient are blood pressure changes, particularly blood pressure drops, and bradycardias. So I have drugs here to deal with that. So let's talk about the blood pressure drops first. I have phenylephrine and ephedrine here. So a phenylephrine in this pre-filled syringe, so we can buy these syringes already made up, 50 milligrams per mil of phenylephrine. 
and we can make it up ourselves. So we have little vials that we dilute in these 100 ml saline bags to make it up. This one is 100 micrograms per ml. So we give 50 to 100 microgram boluses of this to somebody whose blood pressure is dropping and it works as an alpha agonist, so it causes smooth muscle contraction in the blood vessels around the body to try and bring the blood pressure back up. Our other drug here we have is ephedrine. So ephedrine, these come again in these pre-filled syringes, but we can also make them up ourselves. We have little vials of them. We make them up in 10 ml syringes to so three milligrams per ml. Ephedrine works on the alpha and the beta adrenergic receptors. So it causes the alpha contraction in the smooth muscle, but it also causes some beta agonism, meaning that you'll get an increased heart rate with it. So I will decide which of these to give depending on the uh, patient's heart rate. If someone's a bit bradycardic, then I will probably choose ephedrine. If someone's heart rate's a bit fast and I don't want it to go faster, I'll choose phenylephrine. But there are some of our options. I also have a vial here of noradrenaline. So noradrenaline is an extremely potent vasopressor. We have them in these, most hospitals I think have these pre-made 50 ml bottles these days. And it's made of four milligrams and 50 mils. It's a very, very potent vasopressor. It has to be given or is almost always given through a central line because it is a very potent drug and you want to give it into a large volume of blood. So it's given via a central line in the neck or in the femoral vein and someone must have an arterial line when they're using this because you need to be able to monitor the blood pressure to see if you're giving too much or too little. You can cause extremely low or extremely high blood pressure if you don't try to take this correctly. Up here we have a pre-made syringe of atropine. There's half a milligram, so 500 micrograms in this pre-filled syringe. And that's a good adult dose for someone who has a bradycardia, so this is a treat severe bradycardia, use atropine. And finally, down here, I have a pre-filled syringe of succimethonium, and I also have a syringe of succimethonium that I made up from a vial. So this succimethonium is a depolarizing muscle relaxant. It works very, very quickly. You'll see us talk about it and use it in our video that we did on rapid sequence induction. And this works really, really quickly. It causes fasciculations, meaning that the muscles start to contract and fasciculate. So when you give this to the patient, within a few seconds, you'll see all the muscles, the little muscle fibers start to depolarize in their body. And we can talk a little bit more about the specifics of how this drug works, but we keep it here as an emergency in case we need to give someone a muscle, very quick acting muscle relaxant for whatever reason. So there are some of the common drugs we use. You can see that we have a number of labels here for everything and they're all color co coded and this is an international color code for safety. All the opiates, you can see remifentanil, oxycodone, morphine and fentanyl all in blue. Midazolam is in orange or indansetron is always in that beige color. Local anesthetics are gray. Anything that's a vasopressor is purple or purpley lilac. You can see phenylephrine, ephedrine, metaraminol is another alpha agonist like phenylephrine with adrenaline and we have, they don't appear to be here, but we have big noradrenaline stickers as well, also lilac colored. Atropine is always green. All our muscle relaxants are red. See succimethonium, because it's our only depolarizing muscle relaxant is black and red. And all our other muscle relaxants like atricurium and rocuronium are red. Up here, you see red and white hatched. They are the reversal agents for muscle relaxants. So we spoke about rocuronium earlier. This is the reversal agent for rocuronium, Sugamidex. So it reverses a muscle relaxant, so it's red and white hatched. The reversal agent for, uh, another reversal agent for muscle relaxation, that's the trade name, is um, neostigmine and lycoperylate together. And again, that has a red and white hatched sticker. Other drugs are just plain white. So antibiotics, we see our Comoxiclav here is white. Diclofenac is white, sodium chloride, antibiotics, dexamethasone, blank syringes, all plain white. The rest are all a specific color coded um, international standard. We have lots of other drugs in our trolley and lots of backup drugs. Here we can see some magnesium. This is tranexamic acid to help prevent breakdown of clots and bleeding. Glycerol trinitrate, if we want to vasodilate somebody. We use that in cardiac theatre quite a bit. Calcium, to help replace somebody and help them contract well. And then all our trolley is divided out in the exact same way in every theatre. These are the drugs we commonly have or always have in the top trolley. 
We've mentioned most of these already, but this is our, these are our non-steroidals. Metaraminol we mentioned is a presser. Here's our dexamethasone and ondansetron for antiemesis. Midazolam if we need it. Glycoperonium bromide and neostigmine. This is a combined drug for our muscle relaxant reversal. One of them. Glycoperonium to bring heart rate up. Atropine to bring heart rate up. Ephedrine is a vasopressor and clonidine is a sedative and an analgesic and some local anesthetic. You don't need to know all these drugs inside out. All I'm doing is showing you the follies we have and what we have in them. Down in our second drawer, we tend to have a lot of emergency drugs or drugs that aren't used as commonly. So things like amiodarone, um, pre-fill syringes, adrenaline syringes if we have a cardiac arrest, adrenaline if we need to make up infusions, things like that that aren't as commonly used. Naloxone if somebody has too much opiates on board. And we have this on our vials of Sugamidex to reverse uh, our muscle relaxation. In our next drawer, we have mostly antibiotics and saline. So we use a lot of Comoxiclav and Kefiroxine, the common antibiotics we use, but we also have Tycoplanin, Gentamicin, Piperacin and Tazobactam and Flutloxacillin. The cut drugs we commonly have. Over here are suppositories of diphene and paracetamol that we mentioned earlier for our analgesia. These are just little 10 ml bottles of saline and 10 ml bottles of water. In our next drawer, we have all our cannulation equipment. We always have lots of different sizes of cannulas. Yellows are the smallest, 24 gauge, then blue, 22 gauge, then pink is 20 gauge. Bigger again is green, 18 gauge. Bigger again, this one's out in its own, it should be up here, is 16 gauge. And then the biggest we have is this big monster here, the big 14 gauge cannula. And I have all those outlined in my video on cannulation. We have bungs to put on them, swabs to clean the skin, our tourniquets and our dressing. So all our cannulation equipment is in the drawer. Moving down again, just all our syringes and needles for drawing up all our drugs. We mostly use these red blunt syringes. So they're quite blunt at the end. They're not for ever injecting into somebody. They're just for drawing up our medications. If we ever need to inject something to give someone, say, local anesthetic, we use either the orange or the blue needles. Orange is the smallest needle, then blue. Green is bigger again, and then the biggest needles we have are white. They're the biggest ones that you would be very mean indeed to inject somebody with a big white syringe. or big white needle. Down again, the equipment that we have here, we have bags of saline, these ABG needles or syringes. I've gone through these in my video on ABGs. These are temperature probes that go in through the nose or down into the mouth when someone's asleep that helps monitor their temperature. These are just for drawing up out of big bottles. Uh, they're like big, big bones that stick into bottles. It makes it easier to draw up than through a small needle. Big 50 ml syringes and little infusion catheters for big syringes. And then finally down the bottom, we have some blood bottles in case we need to take blood. This is a pink top bottle, so that's for a group and cross match. This is just Cipro, it's another antibiotic, but it just doesn't fit anywhere else because it's a big bottle. You see that Cipro comes in a liquid form, as does Metronidazole. Metronidazole is another antibiotic that comes in this little baggie like this. So they come as bags of saline, or bags of fluid, I should say, or little powder. So we have acetamol bottles, some blood giving sets, and nasogastric tubes everything that we have in our drug trolleys because I know that we won't unfortunately be able to bring you all into theatre and show these things to you the way things are at the moment with the COVID pandemic so I just thought I'd run through everything uh, the last thing I want to show you in this video is this drug press so this is a locked drug press where we keep all our um, controlled drugs, so all our ketamines, our fentanyls, morphines, oxycodones, remifentanyl, all those potentially addictive drugs, potentially dangerous drugs, are kept up in this press. And there's one in every theatre just above the drugs trolley. The anaesthetic nurses keep the keys to that, and they keep a record of all the drugs that we give and who we give them to in this book. So all the controlled drugs, I should say. So that's our anaesthetic trolley. Feel free to have a look at it in your, when you're in theatre and the anaesthetist is with you if they have time at all. I'm sure they'll be happy to go through everything, but I hope this video will help in your understanding of what we have in our little bag of tricks in theatre. Okay, thank you.